to uh, introduce our next uh, group of speakers. Uh, and I'll go ahead and um, give a little bio for the presenters. And then when they come up, they can either add to it or, or deny anything I had to say on this. So uh, in the, the first presentation, uh, we got uh, three folks. I've got John LeBaire. Uh, he's a conservation specialist with TNC. Uh, he's been working with them 16 years. Uh, yeah, that name goes back a long way. Uh, he's been in it for some time with us here in Virginia. He's currently engaged in several projects in the central Appalachians, ranging from climate changing planning to remote sensing for fire effect monitoring. Um, and he likes to say, despite his name, he uh, is not uh, fluent in French, uh, but he does a pretty good imitation of Sir David Attenborough. So um, we got Jean LeVere, and then um, following him is going to be Carolyn Sharp. She's a graduate research assistant at Virginia Tech. And then we have a slight change from your agenda, if you saw it, where we had a, another student, uh, Jennifer Weber, she's a little bit under the weather, so Adam Coates is going to be uh, filling in that time slot for, for Jennifer. So with no further ado, uh, Jean, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thanks a lot, Fred. All right, allow me to share my screen. I'm just going to take a second. I'm going to split my screens, but I'll be right with you as I do that. All right. Okay, are y'all seeing, let's, see, let's turn that off. Sorry, I've got multiple screens. Are y'all seeing the cover of a PowerPoint or are you seeing the behind yeah. the scenes of a PowerPoint? Uh, got senior it. title, title awesome. slide, John. Okay, great. So I'm gonna talk about um, prescribed fire effects monitoring in the Appalachians. And, um, you know, as both Sam and Fred alluded to, we've, in the Appalachians, um, this work has been ongoing for quite a while. And we've got some great data under in the, in the can that we wanted to share with y'all for here. So the first point that I want to make is that everything you're about to hear describes a real group effort. You know, the Fire Learning Network um, is a collection of federal agencies, nature conservancy, state agencies, all working together. Um, you know, this picture is, is a great example. It's an old picture of one of our burns, probably a decade or so ago, but lots of different partners working together. Um, and a lot of this monitoring data comes only from the sweat of all those partners going out in the woods in the middle of the summer to go and count some trees and plants. So hats off to them. And I hope um, we can, this, this summary helps advance all that, all that great hard work. So just to back it up a bit, right? I thought this was appropriate for the intro um, presentation, you know, why we burn just real quick. You know, we believe that we know that fire helped to shape the Appalachians. You know, this ecosystem, like all ecosystems, are a function of, in part of natural disturbance, you know, whether it's wind events on ridge tops or, <clears throat> excuse me, fire on the spur ridges or insects, um, you know, doing their thing. The, the, the Appalachians has been shaped by these natural disturbances. And the, the net result of all that over thousands of years is this mosaic. Um, of ages and structures and obviously species. And, you know, fire is a pretty well um, studied phenomenon. The history of fire in the Appalachians and the consistent theme to come out of that research is that fire was ever present for thousands of years. So we feel comfortable with, um, with the, the, you know, the, the, the theoretical underpinnings of reintroducing a, a shaping force back in the Appalachians. And so it's worth also noting, you know, this might be obvious, but we're in a mixed oak forest. Um, and it has been a mixed oak forest for quite a while. And so, you know, having this mixed oak, for it, mixed oak forest is a defining feature of this, this part of the Appalachians. And oak forests support overall higher levels of diversity than compared to other forest types. Researchers have found that moths and butterflies are in greater uh, diversity and abundance in oak forest interior songbirds. There's been lots of research on our Warm Springs Mountain and surrounding landscapes that show that deer, bear, turkey even, right, benefit from the habitat heterogeneity that is created by fire. So again, um, it's an important ecosystem dominated by oak. 
a result in part of historic disturbance. Um, and that the, the diversity that we have today that we inherited, you know, whether it's forest interior songbirds, wildflowers, lepidopterans, right? It's all higher because of uh, having an oak forest and having that disturbance. So the desired conditions, you know, that we're trying to achieve through a burning program in the Appalachians, we want this mix of structures. We want this mosaic. And those structures, you know, can very broadly be described as we want some shady, dense, closed canopy for us. We want some semi sunny open canopy woodlands shown there in the middle, intermediate levels of tree canopy, grassy, wildflowery in the understory. And then we also want you know, this fully sunlit early successional habitat, early successional forest, young forest, right? Where there's not much mature, there's very little mature tree canopy. We have a new generation of forest being established. And while that forest is being established, it's very rich with forbs, uh, grasses, and wildflowers. So we want this mosaic, you know, not one of these um, conditions by itself is what we want. We want them all together. And then it's important to say that we want oaks to remain dominant, you know, the, that a lot of our biodiversity is tied to the high levels of biodiversity and productivity are tied to oaks. And so that's also a discrete goal and pine as well. Um, so then, uh, you know, does our current forest equal our desired forest? And quite frankly, the answer is no. You know, do we have a mix of structures today? Um, no. So here's an example. Here's about 100,000 acres of the, uh, the GW. And if it's blue, it's this is satellite imagery that's showing the density of the tree canopy. If it's blue, it's closed canopy shady forest. If it's yellow or green, it's something else that's open or early. And guess what? As you can see, it's almost exclusively blue. You, know, you see little patches of, of early and open. If those are hard to see, um, that's accurate. You know, they're small uh, and they're mostly created by management, although there is some natural disturbance in there. Um, do we have new oaks? The answer is no. You know, there's this long established trend of maple and other species replacing oak. So um, here's this is actual forest inventory data. Uh, oaks are in green, maple is in red. And we're looking at big trees here on the right, small trees on the left. And you see that the big trees are dominated by oak and green. But as we move into the smaller size classes, we see this precipitous drop off of oak and green replaced by red maple, black gum and other species. And so there's a shift away from oak. Um, so our goals for burning are to reverse these two problematic trends. Um, so, you know, to put another way, our goals for prescribed burning, we want to moderately reduce the overstory. We want to significantly reduce the midstory and shrub layer. Those two goals kind of describe this open woodland condition. You see it here on this picture um, on the right hand of your screen. This side of the road has been burned and you see the kind of the intermediate. There's some trees left. There's intermediate levels of light on the left side here has been unburned. We see a lot more structure obscuring the forest floor. So again, this is one condition, open woodlands, reduce the overstory, reduce the midstory and shrub layer, create patches of early successional forest, right? We want that young forest. Um, and we also wanna create a new generation of oak seedlings. So all this is consistent, right? With what we think the historical landscape was, where we, uh, where we have impediments to that today, this is what burning is seeking to achieve. Um, so just a brief note about scale, um, you know, 100, uh, around 150,000 acres um, in the western part of Virginia are now under long term fire, a long term fire regime around, you know, a little less than 10 percent of public land, state, federal, et cetera. Um, what you see here in red is a burn unit boundary. Um, the darker green is, in this case, just the uh, national forest. But anyway, just to give you a sense of you know, where burning occurs and, and its spatial arrangement. Um, you know, we burn these that 150,000 acres on a rotation of say five to 10 years. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> so we go out and get burning done. We're comfortable with what we're doing, that it's ecologically appropriate and that our actions will eventually lead to our goals. But, um, you know, this is a complex phenomenon, reintroducing fire. And so um, we and our environment is changing. We have new invasive species, climate change is occurring slowly. 
And so we need to invest and we have invested in monitoring as a way to check our assumptions, you know, to, um, to check in on whether or not we're achieving the goals that we set out to do. So let's briefly go through the types of monitoring that we do. Uh, we do field monitoring. You know, we have around 400 plots and around 40 burn units across the forest. And we revisit those plots after every burn. And here's one of our teams right here. This is a Forest Service and TNC employees going out in the woods and again, measuring a lot of different layers of vegetation. And we'll talk about some of that. Um, but we have data, we have a, a robust data set after you know one to three burns. We have some data about even burns four and five. Um, also at these points, we take photo monitor, we, we take photographs, we do photo monitoring because it's just an informal way of giving us a picture of what it looks like in addition to all that great data. And this data really tells us about forest composition, you know, which tree species are increasing and what size classes. Um, it tells us some about forest structure. Did we thin out the tree canopy? Did we thin out the shrub layer in the forest floor? Another type of monitoring we do is GIS-based monitoring, remote sensing monitoring, using aerial imagery, photographs, satellite data. So we can map the forest canopy before and after burns using this data. And we've examined every major burn back to the year 2000-ish. Um, and so we have data about these areas that have been burned repeatedly once, twice, three, four times. And so when we, we can map out where we've had changes to the canopy, right? We can spatially map that and, and quantify. So these, this data tells us more about forest structure, you know, where are there are these visible changes in forest structure. It is blind to composition. We can't, we can't know um, what's going on inside of uh, or below the canopy. You know, we don't know whether uh, baby oaks are growing. That's where we need the field monitoring data. So this, this sorts of monitoring is complementary. So, um, Okay, so let's talk about the results. We've got the context. We know what we're doing out. We've shown what we're doing out there. Um, what are our results? And so first, let's look at the overstory. You know, the remote sensing. Where we, when we've done this, we see that in various burn units, we've got some burns that have very little visible impact on the canopy when looking from above, and others have more. And so um, when we burn once, you know, this is. This is about the percentage of acreage in these different categories of early succession, open woodlands, closed canopy. And we see we get a little bit of early and open after a burn, but the majority of the unit remains closed canopy. When we burn four times, we see some increases in early and open. That's great. So we're making progress. So what's the relevant to our goal, relevance to our goals? In the overstory, we are consistently creating early successional and open woodlands habitat. That's great. We're thinning out the canopy in those places. Um, we're creating this mosaic um, and that it, those conditions increase with each burn. Um, so let's now go to the uh, underneath the canopy. And so I should say that I'm going to focus now on the let's say 70 to 80 to 90% of a burn unit that remains closed canopy. What's happening there? So we know it's been burned, but the canopy remains uh, mostly intact. Are we having changes there? And the answer is we are. So this is the mid-story stems, 10 to 30 feet tall. Um, and again, this is from our field plot data. And so what we see um, in the pre-burn period, we have all stems here in black, red maple and red oaks and green. And we see in looking at the black line first that we have a pretty dense mid-story, but that it is significantly reduced after one burn and even more after two and three burns. And the same is true for red maple. And there wasn't that much oak to begin with, but it also reduces a bit. And that's great. That mid-story, especially when we're controlling non-oak species, that mid-story is getting in the way of baby oaks, the next generation of oaks becoming established. And so, you know, um, so there are the results and then the significance to our goals, um, this thinning out the mid-story will help new oak seedlings to thrive and survive. We're not yet seeing new oaks, young oaks here, but that's fine. We are, we are creating the conditions for them to be established. So let's look at the next layer down. So these are saplings, three to 10 feet tall. A few lines here, but let's go through them. Um, what we see is that the sapling layer, all tree species in black starts off high, excuse me, starts off high and then declines over time. 
Uh, so again, that's good. We're, it's a really dense layer and we're thinning it out with fire. Red maple in red here in the pre-burn time period uh, starts off relatively low. It spikes after one burn. Maple sprouts like crazy. Lots of species do. But then uh, it de declines significantly after two and three burns. That's great. We're reducing the, the stocks of maple. Um, oaks, you know, again, weren't here to begin with. We expected that. We're not yet seeing them become established, but again, we're creating space for them to become established. Let's look at shrubs in blue, you know, shrubs, mountain laurel, vaccinium to some extent, blueberries. Uh, very dense, very dense. And that gets knocked back significantly after one burn and maybe spikes a bit after two and three, but is basically held in check. So again, there are the results. The relevance here is that by reducing shrubs and maples, these competing species to oaks, um, by reducing their numbers over time, uh, we we'll, we are creating the space for oaks to become established. We're not yet seeing new oak seedlings, but this is part of the long-term process of, of what we want to see in the forest. So just a graphic now to kind of end, end on a, a more colorful note here. So again, I wanted to show um, what this looks like in the woods structurally. Um, we've reduced the mid-story. We're going to see that now, right? We've removed that mid-story of interfering medium-sized trees. Next, uh, we are also reducing the shrub layer in blue there. We're going to reduce maple saplings. We saw that in red. Boop, those are gone. Okay, so we're thinning out the forest. Um, looking ahead to the future, we will continue to reduce the overstory a bit, you know, trying to thin it out, moving from closed canopy to open woodlands in many cases. You know, there we go. We have a little bit of the canopy removed. And we want to keep the mid story and the understory reduced. That's what the repeated burning does. The repeated entries keep um, all of those maples and shrubs are not dead. They're top killed and they'll sprout back. And so this repeated burning is designed to keep them in check. And this we feel confident will lead to new oaks over time. And so in summary, this is a great picture of, of, of one of our burn units. I think this summarizes it all. You're seeing um, open woodlands here in blue. You're seeing early successional patches in yellow and the remainder of um, the forest is in closed canopy, but we're creating this mosaic. And this is after only two burns. We're creating this mosaic across the landscape over time. So um, that's all I got. I will stop sharing and pass the mic to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, hand this off now to um, Caroline, please. Hello, just going to share my screen real quick. Yeah, we see it. Looks good, Caroline. All right, good deal. So this is kind of a summary of my master's project that I'm working on. And the whole theme of it is, does prescribed burning affect wood quality in the Appalachian Mountains? So um, a little bit of background, I got my undergrad from Clemson University in wildlife and fisheries biology. And while I was at Clemson, I got involved in the Fire Tigers program, which is Clemson's student prescribed burning crew. It's super awesome. I loved it. And we worked <clears throat> in a partnership with the Forest Service. So when I graduated from Clemson, I did a seasonal job with the U.S. Forest Service. And I loved it, but it was only temporary. So Dr. Coates reached out to me about coming to Virginia Tech, and I said yes. So that's where I'm at now, but I'm about to go back to the Forest Service as a wildland fire apprentice starting in the next couple weeks. So it's a little bit about me. An overview of my project is to combat some misconceptions about prescribed fire in West Virginia. This study was conducted on the Monica Gila National Forest. And up there, the timber buyers are hesitant to even buy charred trees because they think that that reflects that the wood quality is damaged. So my study was looking to disprove that and to encourage their prescribed burning on the national forest. Um, a little bit about my study setup. So at each unit, 
I would set up a series of plots. So inside the unit, I would have 20 like burn plots. And then we would have five plots outside of that as a control. So I ended up having 115 burn plots and 28 controls. Some of the stuff we looked at was on the plot level, like aspect, slope, and elevation. And then on like a tree level, we looked at species, diameter, some wounds, and then I graded the trees. And I'm currently in the stage of data analysis. So some types of wounds that we saw a lot, um, this right here is an example of an oval. You can see it's kind of like elliptically shaped. And then also you can see some bark slough on this tree, it's just like where the bark is coming off and you can see some actual wood. <clears throat> and then you also just see the char, which is this, essentially it's just blackened bark. And it's really just on the surface. But this middle picture is an example of a seam. So you can see like this little line in the middle where two, I guess where the tree has healed over that wound. So you just see a little line now. And then on the far left, you see this cat face and it's kind of triangular in shape and they're usually at the base of a tree. So those were some examples of wounds that we saw. And then so far I found that prescribed fire has a very minimal reduction to wood quality and it results in very little volume loss over the stand level from those damages and then for my analysis i'm going to be comparing like the burn units to the control units and then some units burn once to units burn twice to really see if fire has any effect at all so i have a little bit of preliminary stuff but it's mostly like species so these are my control plots that i looked at and over all the control plots, you can see that um, northern red oak and chestnut oak were the main species that I found, and they were also the main species that were wounded. But then you can see on the far right one that over all of my wounds that I found, ovals were three quarters, three quarters of those. And then looking at my burn units, you can see that species abundance and species wounded were a little bit, they're more similar, but you can still see that the northern red oak and the chestnut oak were more abundant overall. And then that reflected in the ones that were wounded, they were the majority still. But then if you look at wounds by type, you can see that char was over 50%. So um, I think that char is just superficial, but we would have to actually get the trees milled and processed to 100% confirm that. But if you exclude char, you can see that the other wounds are kind of similar to what was found in the control units. And then some next steps for this study would be, like I said, actually milling the trees and then looking at the actual quality of the wood and how does that reflect on my estimates in the field and how does that reflect on like the tree grade and everything. And then expanding this study to a larger area to include like not only more species and more trees, but areas that were burned two times, areas that were burned three, four or five times. That would be, I guess, a long-term study to turn this into. All right, now I have any questions. Yeah. Thanks, Caroline. Maybe uh, folks, remember if you have some questions, we're gonna, looks like we'll have a little bit of time when all three presenters are done in this little section. So um, post them in the chat or hang tight and we'll get to some questions in a little bit. Very interesting, Caroline, thank you. And now we'll hand it, hand it over to, uh, back to Adam who is, sitting in for Jennifer Weber on the next section. So Adam, it's all yours. Right, so Jennifer is not feeling super well today, but she did take time um, to record some of her um, results and kind of a little bit of a discussion about prescribed fire and pollinators. So I'm gonna share that as a video. 
Um, just give one second. Hello, everyone. Uh, my hey, name no. is Jennifer Weber. Um, I am a PhD Good student enough. working with Dr. Adam Coates over at Virginia Tech. Um, and I also serve as the pollinator ecologist uh, for the Conservation Management Institute, um, also under the banner of Virginia Tech. Um, I do apologize that I am not here in person to deliver this talk. Uh, my health is will not allow it at this point. Um, but my contact information is, has been included at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions or comments, you are more than welcome to let me know. Um, all right, let's get into this. Okay, so a little bit of background before I toss you guys off the deep end. Um, a lot of my, obviously my job title, title is pollinator ecologist, so I spend a lot of time working on pollinators. Um, insect populations, pollinators or otherwise, are in the middle of a rapid decline. Um, we're seeing reports of almost 80% decline um, globally. Uh, and the primary culprit has been indicated as habitat loss uh, caused by a rapidly changing climate, caused by land conversion for human uses, uh, and so on. Uh, while this is very problematic, it is also fairly easy uh, to rectify, at least on paper. Um, with habitat loss being a major driver of declines, we that means we need to turn our focus to protecting and improving the habitat that still exists. Uh, and something that I am sure is of great interest to all of you here today, uh, many species of insect, including the pollinators that I spend most of my time with, thrive in early successional habitats, um, the open fields and meadows that result from ecological disturbances like fire. So luckily, we have a potentially untapped source of these sorts of lands um, in our military lands. Uh, especially here in Virginia, the Department of Defense holds over 200,000 acres of land. Um, on installations ranging in size from rather large to somewhat small. Uh, the good news is part of the training mission from the armed forces requires that these installations maintain intact, healthy ecosystems for the training exercises. Uh, because these are still federal lands, the installations are required to comply with federal mandates regarding biological conservation. So that means we have large tracts of land that we can actually use for conservation, um, even if we don't think that they might be the best choice right off the bat. Uh, as it turns out, these lands are actually invaluable. Um, if your organism can stand the occasional, you know, explosion or fire, or maybe a, a, some sort of tactical wheel vehicle rolling through, uh, these are very well protected areas. Um, examples of success stories include our little small world begonia, uh, the red cockaded woodpecker, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, and St. Francis Seder, uh, a little butterfly native to the southeast. So through CMI, um, I spend a lot of time on military bases, uh, and one of our longtime partners is Marine Corps Base Quantico uh, up in northeastern Virginia. Um, it's located near Triangle, so you can sort of see up on that map, it's not far away from DC. Uh, the base was formally established in 1917 and today covers about 50,000 acres, 55,000 acres of land. Um, the primary purpose of this base is training uh, for the Marines, um, as well as for a couple other uh, acronyms uh, that have, uh, and still have uh, facilities on the base, um, including the FBI and the DEA and several others. Um, as you can see, that's quite a bit of land that's undeveloped. Um, so there is a lot of land management practices used to maintain those intact ecosystems on this installation. Uh, they include 
uh, mechanical management, things like mowing and disking, um, pesticide and herbicide application, uh, and fire, um, both prescribed and accidental fire. Um, sometimes you can't really stop the shrapnel from setting other things on fire. Uh, so a few years back, we were contacted by our colleagues at Quantico to come out and do some bee surveys for them. Um, so in 2019, uh, we headed out and started the first round. We returned in 2020 and 2021 um, to complete this survey and inventory for them. Um, we used a combination of passive and active trapping. So passive is these cup traps that you see, um, the little line of colored cups going into the distance. Uh, an active trapping, aka hand netting, which is us wandering around the field catching insects, um, to collect the specimens that we needed to provide them information with what was actually on their base. Uh, while we were out there uh, with an eye towards my doctoral work, we also collected data on the types of disturbance present in the fields where we sampled. Um, this included evidence of mechanical maintenance, uh, basically whether it had been mowed recently, um, training usage, if I could find tread marks from tactical vehicles uh, or if we accidentally ran into people when we were out there, um, and burns, uh, as well as information on the vegetative communities of these sites, uh, their soil type, and sort of how compacted that soil had become uh, over time. Um, once we collected all of the specimens, either out of the cups or from our netting, um, all of them were pinned out, uh, as you can see in the picture on the far right, um, and identified the species where possible. So I'm going to share with you uh, some of the early results now that I have finally gotten through all of the identification process. So in total, we collected over a thousand specimens um, and found that these specimens represented about 99 plus species, uh, representing 29 genera from five of the six families known from the Eastern US. Uh, for a little bit of context, there are about 400 species of bees known from Virginia. So that means that on this one base, at least a quarter of the known species are present. So the graph that I'm showing you is called the species accumulation curve. Uh, and basically what this curve is, is a plot of how many, the cumulative number of species per collection event. Uh, so that means that as I, uh, essentially how many new species are added every time I go back and collect something new. Um, with the idea being that as this curve continues on, it will hopefully level off um, and hit sort of an asymptote. Uh, and that asymptote would tell us that, hey, you've collected every single species from this base that you can. Um, leveling off of that curve tells me that most of the species of, in this area have likely been detected. Uh, that plus next to the 99 uh, represents a genera known as lazy glossum um, that might make up the last little group of species to let that trend truly curve off. Uh, but we won't know until I finish identifying all of that. Uh, so we took this lovely information back to our friends at Marine Corps Base Quantico. And their next question was, well, we can't stop all of the activity on the base. So what area should we focus on? Um, how can we promote greater biodiversity in our uh, target areas? So taking that nice large data set, um, I have subsetted the uh, species database down to six sites uh, in order to figure out how these disturbances that we see on the base, uh, mechanical, fire, military usage, uh, how do they affect these different communities? Um, so we selected six sites from varying sizes, usage, maintenance, and fire frequency. Um, and eventually, once I get around to doing stats, uh, pairs of these sites will be used to determine sort of what the effects are of each of these disturbances. Um, the analysis is underway, but there are some early trends. So I'm going to pull out two of the sites for you all. Um, this is landing zone dove and drop zone cockatoo. Um, 
as you can see, they are very fairly close together and fairly close in size. Um, they experience similar mechanical disturbances, their mode fairly regularly, uh, and are within a mile of each other. The major difference is cockatoo was burned recently. Uh, Dove's burn was scheduled, but then had to be delayed due to COVID um, and was not burned during the time period where we were taking all of our samples. So if you look over at the table underneath the map, you will see that in terms of the Simpsons Diversity Index and the Shannon Diversity Index, two actually has a higher biodiversity than doves, um, despite the fact that they are very close by and experience a lot of similar disturbances. Um, in fact, all three of our highest burn, of our highest biodiversity sites or those indices are all at least partially burned. Um, albatross and stork filling in around cockatoo. So what does this tell us? Um, that even on more disturbed landscapes, fire is pretty good for bees. Uh, is fire alone sparking this increase in biodiversity? That's still unclear. Uh, of course, there's more data to get through, but it's definitely something that should be considered when you're trying to manage for pollinators. So the next steps for me, adding in the vegetation and the soils data. Uh, vegetation will tell me about nectar and pollen resources, and the soils will tell me about nesting sites. And these sort of answer the two big questions when you're doing uh, animal conservation. Where does it live and what does it eat? Um, we'd also like to do some comparisons between installations. Uh, Quantico is a middle ground of sorts. Um, there are other installations in Virginia that have different levels of disturbances, different usage, uh, and different land management practices. Um, so we'd like to see if the trends that we find at Quantico are the same on these other installations or is something else going on. Uh, so that will be uh, occupying my time for the next few years. Um, but if you have any questions, you are more than likely to send them to that nice little email address. And again, I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but if not, I will offer special thanks to all of our friends uh, in the Natural Resources and Environmental Affairs Office at Quantico who have put up with me tromping over their base for several years catching bugs. Um, my colleagues at the Conservation Management Institute who have followed me around uh, as I have been catching bugs on the bases. Um, and my committee members, uh, Dr. Coates, Dr. Emmerich, Dr. Ford, and Dr. Kovalon, um, who have been reading about all of, about all of uh, the bugs that I have captured as I have traveled through the base. Um, and with that, I hope you guys have a great rest of the meeting and a great rest of your day. Great, great, fantastic. Adam, do you want any uh, closing comments to that section? Anything else to add? No, I think I'm good. Okay, good. Uh, there were a couple questions. Uh, some real interesting studies going on there, Tech to Adam, with your, your folks. So um, we have some time, so we'll go ahead and, and try to get to a couple questions in the chat. Is that okay, at, um, Lindsay? Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. All right. So we have, uh, should we back up to the first one? And uh, sometimes they're directed to somebody. So if it's to you, please open your mic and answer. Uh, John, this is to you. It's, uh, it's from Mike Dice. It's interesting that you're not seeing oak regeneration increasing. Have you all looked at any form of deer exclusion devices or test effects on deer brows on the oak stems? Yeah, good question. Uh, we have not. Um, we haven't really uh, explored kind of systematically looking at, ex, you know, brows, pressure. Um, I think the overall sense is that even in, you know, particularly since we're burning at such a large scale, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're, you know, there's, I'm sh we're sure that there's some brows effect, but um, doesn't see like I'm, I'm just thinking of the of the plots I've been on and for other folks that have collected this data you chime up as well um you know occasionally you'll see clear sign of brows you know munch uh, a, a bunch of seedlings all munched at the same height not super common um so um likely to be an impact doesn't seem like it's a huge one at the moment and we have not um done that sort of research but it's a good idea okay good all right, and let's see, we got uh, next one um, from Ron Hughes, I guess, uh, Caroline, this is kind of um, to you. It talks, 
Uh, if you find that charring or fire does not really affect the quality of the timber product, how do we get that message out there to the timber industry? What's your magic wand? A good question. That's a very hard question. Um, I would say, I mean, you could always like print out the results and hand them to them, but I feel like they don't really care about that. So uh, maybe like a demonstration day and you could have like your main timber buyers come in and you'll be like, all right, guys, look at this tree. What do you think? And I know there's a portable sawmill. So if you could like have them look at it and they're like, oh, this tree is damaged. Look at all that char and stuff. And then actually mill it up right there and like show them. They'd be like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's not so bad. So I feel like something um, that they can see would be more valuable than handing them a paper with numbers on it. Yeah, let me just add to that. And that's a real good role for the uh, council and all the prescribed fire councils. You know, it's our, it's our responsibility to take this knowledge that we're gaining uh, over the years with all our partners and, and folks such as Caroline and, 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 you know, have that in our back pocket when we have an opportunity to share it with, with folks and to let them know, like he's, like Caroline was saying though, um, you know, it's one thing to just have and talk about it and hand them a, a flyer or something, but then get them out and actually see it. So I think a combination of all that stuff, but again, don't, don't lose sight that that's a, a key responsibility of, of everyone that belongs to the fire council is to be proponents of, of what it is we're learning about. So good, Karen, thank you. All right, uh, Bruce had a statement says, when I burn my fields for habitat maintenance in January, February, am I not killing the resident insects? So I know that um, Jennifer's not here to address that. Um, Adam, you wanna maybe try to field that? Yeah, it looks like it looks like Zach had actually responded to that. Oh, okay. So it's to Zach, did you want to provide any additional comments there? No, it's just it's a that's a very great question, and it's, I mean, and so yeah, I do fire, but I studied ants when I was in uh, college, and I just I just love ants. And the deeper you get into some of these insect fire qu uh, questions, it's so hard to get an answer, but what because there are folks that are really concerned about specific uh, butterflies and fire maintained prairies uh, in australia there's a role that ants play in uh dispersing seeds and fire maintained habitats it's crazy so the you know the question of hey you know what bugs do i have out there and how does fire affect it it's so hard um but overall what we to the the typical answer is just try to burn in blocks and, you know, you've got habitat so insects can flow back and forth. And it's almost like, you know, fire, we know fire maintains habitats health and overall will have uh, a greater diversity of insects if you just keep doing that. Um, but it's a great question with no easy answer. Yeah. Are there, are there any easy ones, Zach? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the next one is, is kind of maybe just a statement, but uh, if anybody wants to comment on it, it says uh, it would be interesting to see if plant diversity increases over time when fire is applied versus mechanical manipulation. Again, uh, you know, fire versus mechanical. So short of yes, it would be interesting to see <laughs> as the, the science and, and the research shows. Um, I think we're maybe in the middle of that stream right now. Right. See, Adam shaking his head. Yeah, I think that's part of what can happen with the military-based disturbances. There's multiple options of looking at both kind of fire alone, the mechanical application, and then some interaction of the two. Uh, so it sets up really nicely. The I think one of the confounding issues we're always trying to think about too, though, is a lot of these studies were, were observing what has occurred after the practices have already been established. And so kind of also then establishes some controls where we don't think anything has been done, you know, in recent in recent history. And with some of the military bases, that becomes a little complicated because they, they, they do make really good use of all the land they have. So, but good, very good point. Yeah. Yeah, we got a couple minutes left. So any questions, you know, please put them in the in the chat. But I have one, uh, Jean, I'll follow up um, if you don't mind. Uh, most of your focus is on the public lands, forest service lands uh, in, in your area of uh, study. Um, I would uh, make the uh, assumption, there's that terrible word, 
you know, that the statistics that we're seeing on private lands are significantly less than that, just because of the volume of burning probably done. Um, so I guess, you know, again, is there a magic wand? How do we, how do we, you know, try to turn that, that tide, that, that, that um, trend that you were talking about, you know, when we incorporate not only the, the public lands, because sometimes it's easier to accomplish things on public lands than it is on private lands. So any, any words of wisdom along those lines, John? I don't have any, but I bet my colleagues, Sam Lindblom or uh, other more venerable members of the Prescribed Burn Council would have an, an answer because I think they've thought about that more about how to crack that nut. Yeah. So Sam? Uh, or anyone else? Yeah, thanks for calling me. I don't have a... <laughs> <laughs> the private lands question is big. I think you're right, Fred. Um, uh, you know, it's, it is a lot easier to burn at big scales and, and accomplish a lot of these things on, on public lands. There's so many private landowners that everybody's different, you know, um, expanding the use of prescribed power on private lands is, a, is a, is a big goal. And, um, so I don't really have any great answers. There, John. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't intentionally setting, setting you up for this, but yeah, um, you know, the private lands, like you said, there, there's um, we're, we're nibbling that elephant with a lot smaller bites. And I think we need to recognize that that's as valuable as some of these large scale burns when we put it all together and package it. So again, uh, this is a, again, a role of, of prescribed fire councils uh, is to, to educate um, landowners and uh, folks that have um, property that they're managing uh, for diversity and stuff. So again, it's just, it's more of a challenge to all of us than trying to find an exact answer on that. Um, any other questions pop up yet? Um, let's see. We need more email addresses for the presenters. I think we will be sending everybody a list of the cadre and contacts um, afterwards, right, Lindsay? Yeah, we can certainly do that. Yeah, let's see. Uh, I think Ron Klepf had a question about um, what other species are constitute that black line in the mid story. You know, what, what else is in the mid story? Um, and so the answer to that in the mid story, that you know, ten to thirty foot tall stem is black gum, sourwood, red maple, probably first and foremost red maple. Um, those are some of the top culprits in the smaller size classes. It's uh, you know what's regenerating in the you know three to ten foot after burning. It's sassafras, it's American chestnut, uh, witch hazel, sourwood, um, black locust. So when I look at a, that suite of species, I don't see a ton of competitors for the canopy. Um, you know, if if we're concerned about oaks getting created and then you know, in the race for the canopy that ensues, um, you know, oak beats a lot of those competing species because they aren't canopy species, you know, uh, witch hazel, sourwood, you know, sassafras to some extent can certainly be a tree, but typically peters out, you know, after a, a couple of decades. So anyway, hope that answers the question. Thanks. And I'm going to ask you one more because that's going to lead us right into our next presentation. There's some other questions, like I said, we'll try to answer those, but uh, I got one here, John. I said, I'm wondering how much trouble you're having with invasives like Japanese silk grass moving into your sites. So in our monitoring data set, uh, we monitor for invasives and I didn't show the ground cover part of this, um, and, and, but I should say that the invasives would have been noted in the mid story or the sapling layer, but also in the ground cover. We don't, you know, this landscape is relatively dry. Uh, it's on the xeric end of the, of the spectrum. And so we don't see a lot of invasives show up in our data set. Anecdotally, we definitely know that they are out there, uh, particularly on the more mesic sites. You know, if you've got a, a poplar stand and you do a timber harvest in it, yeah, you know, likely you're going to get microstegium, you know, or, or the, you're more likely to get microstegium in sites like that, the more mesic, you know, more productive sites. We don't have a lot of those sites, so we're not seeing a lot of Elanthus and Polonia and microstegium, thankfully. Uh, if we did, that would be something that we would, you know, be concerned about, but we're not seeing a, a ton of it. 
much right. at all, really. Yeah. 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 Thanks for that. And, and thanks, everybody, for your interactions and your questions. I've posted some really good thought-provoking type questions.